Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our briefing to discuss the outbound powered flyby burn that occurred 7.44 a.m. Eastern Time this morning, and shortly thereafter, our closest approach to the moon at just 81 statute miles above the lunar surface. Additionally, today we're going to be discussing the post-launch assessments of the Space Launch System rocket and exploration ground systems at Kennedy Space Center. Joining me today, I have Mike Serafin, the Artemis One Mission Manager, Judd Freeling, a Flight Director, and Howard Hugh, Orion Program Manager. We're going to start off with some opening remarks from our guests before we move into the Q&A portion. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. All right. Thank you, Leah. And uh, good afternoon. Thank you for continuing to follow the Artemis Program and the Artemis One Mission. Right now, we um, are setting up to orbit the moon. We had the uh, big burn called the outbound powered flyby occur earlier today, and that was, uh, to date, the largest uh, propulsive event as Artemis is hunting the moon to, uh, to uh, accomplish the distant retrograde orbit in our, in our um, stress test of the Orion spacecraft. As we enter the middle leg of this mission, uh, we've largely com completed the outbound leg uh, towards the moon. We're going to have a, a period of time circling about the moon in the distant retrograde orbit, and then we're going to have the return leg. And if we could bring up the uh, Artemis One mission map, uh, I'll walk you through a couple of key decisions here. Uh, if you look at that green line, is we've headed uh, from the surface of the Earth uh, on the, the middle of last week uh, through the point of translunar injection, and we completed the disposal of the uh, Aram Kral propulsion stage, and our rocket did its job, and Orion has uh, initiated the start of that outbound-powered flyby. Uh, earlier today, we uh, performed what is bullet number nine on, the, uh, on that uh, graphic, and we're setting up for the distant retrograde insertion, which is that gray racetrack about the moon. So that first leg, uh, the green leg, is largely complete, and we will um, officially enter that uh, distant retrograde orbit when we complete the distant retrograde insertion here um, uh, in, later this week. The middle leg will be uh, half a lap in that distant retrograde orbit, and uh, we will be coming up um, in, the, in a little over a week on the uh, farthest point from Earth at bullet number 11 before we initiate the return leg, that blue leg, where we depart the distant retrograde orbit and then um, at bullet 13 essentially perform our deorbit maneuver from uh, over a quarter million miles away at the return powered flyby. So in terms of uh, decision gates, you know, we had a number of pre-planned decision gates. The mission management team is going to meet uh, on the following dates to set up for uh, the, the key decision gates. We could adjust these if we need to, but uh, on November 30th, we will meet to uh, discuss departing the distant retrograde orbit, which is essentially reversing that two maneuver sequence uh, through bullets 12 and 13 on that, uh, on that mission map. And that sets up the distant retrograde departure on December the 1st, followed by the return powered flyby on December the 5th. Uh, a uh, subsequent area following decision gate will occur on December the 5th. Uh, now that we're setting up the, uh, the return leg home, uh, we will be meeting to decide um, to uh, deploy the recovery forces. A joint U.S. Navy and NASA team uh, will depart on a recovery ship from Naval Base San Diego, and that will set up for the ship's departure on, on or about December the 6th uh, for the recovery zone in the uh, Pacific Ocean. And then on December the 8th, uh, Judd will bring in a recommendation as our entry flight director, along with Melissa Jones, our recovery director, uh, uh, in combination with the U.S. Navy, uh, and we'll pick a landing site out in the Pacific, and it'll, it'll be based on a whole host of factors, but um, also weather. Uh, we've got to uh, decide where our weather, uh, best weather is, and we could sail up to 1,200 nautical miles from our uh, nominal landing site uprange and still meet our entry conditions. So uh, those are the three big decision gates, November 30th, December 5th, and December 8th. In the meantime, the mission continues to proceed uh, as we had planned, and the, the, um, the, the uh, ground systems, our operations teams, and the Orion spacecraft continue to exceed expectations, and we continue to learn along the way uh, about this uh, new deep spacecraft. Uh, in terms of the mission management team, uh, since the last time I, I spoke with you, we did meet on uh, Saturday, November the 19th, uh, which was flight day four. We had a two-hour decisional meeting, uh, which uh, the decision was whether or not to commit to the distant retrograde orbit. 
the vehicle systems were very clean. We were working uh, only a, a number of funnies in terms of uh, uh, what I would call a, a, um, a difference from what we expected the vehicle to perform, but none of those were constraints to committing to the distant retrograde orbit. So all of the uh, team members uh, polled as go for the distant retrograde, or, distant retrograde orbit, and then our flight ops team executed the uh, outbound powered flyby uh, earlier today. Uh, we did also on Saturday discuss two special topics, which I'll elaborate here in a few minutes. <clears throat> and the first was the uh, Space Launch Systems post-launch performance report, as well as the Exploration Ground Systems post-launch performance report. Uh, we did not meet on Sunday, November the 20th, uh, largely because things are going really well. And I, I think the fact that we didn't meet on Sunday uh, is, is a great sign. Um, we, uh, we also worked some feedback uh, from, from the, uh, the media and from the team on uh, keeping uh, and improving the flow of information and, um, and expediting imagery, and, and uh, that I hope you're seeing uh, some improvements along the way. Uh, but we, we did hear the feedback, and we are working on that. Uh, today, we met as a mission management team for one hour, uh, and uh, it was a non-decisional meeting, uh, but we largely resynchronized the team. We t discussed the results of the outbound powered flyby. Uh, we talked about a uh, exterior image uh, imagery survey of the uh, of the spacecraft using the solar ray wingtip cameras. Uh, we looked at the back shell thermal protection system as well as a, a number of um, external surfaces on the spacecraft and there were no concerns identified as a result of that external survey. Uh, and we do have two anomaly re, uh, resolution teams currently in work under, um, under Howard's uh, um, uh, mission evaluation room uh, that are uh, reviewing some, um, some uh, bits that are being set on the star trackers periodically that we're recovering with the power cycles as well as some uh, funny indications that we're seeing on the uh, on the power system and uh, and those are again not seen as is hard concerns or hard constraints we're just trying to understand those better as we're flying and executing the flight test in the flight environment so that those are the decision gates that we have ahead of us as well as the uh, the recent activities with the mission management team in terms of the post-launch performance summary that we had with the Space Launch System rocket, uh, I will simply say that the results were eye-watering. The, uh, the rocket uh, performed and or exceeded expectations. Everything was either on predict or off by less than 1%. In fact, it was off by less than 0.3% in all cases across the board. The, uh, the day of launch, we had the, uh, the solid boosters. They had a uh, propellant uh, bulk temperature of 77 degrees, which is well within the, the mid-range. It wasn't on the hot end like we had for the prior launch attempt, and it's certainly not on the cold end of what's tested. It was in the mid-range. The boosters performed as planned and as predicted. The core stage performed as planned and as predicted. Uh, the insertion altitude, we missed by three nautical miles. We, we planned on a uh, 972 by 16 nautical mile orbit. Uh, when you think about the uh, size of the system that we have and how much performance it puts out when the engines are at full throttle, we're producing two million pounds of thrust uh, out of the four RS-25 engines. The uh, core stage engine shutdown um, missed by seven feet per second, which is simply remarkable. That is well within the, the uh, error and noise bands of the system. Uh, in terms of the uh, interim cryo propulsion stage, it, it was spot on in terms of the translunar injection as well as the uh, disposal. The RL-10 engine on the interim cryo propulsion stage set a record uh, for the uh, duration uh, for the translunar injection burn. It is the longest firing in the history of the RL-10 program at 18 minutes. Uh, there were no failures on the, uh, on the entire uh, Space Launch System stack, and there were five observations. Um, none of those are of consequence or of any particular uh, constraint to the, uh, the flight of crew. Um, all of the separation events, again, were um, as designed and as predicted. So again, we had eye-watering performance of the Space Launch System rocket. In terms of the ex, uh, exploration ground systems performance, uh, we, we did uh, go all the way from the operations in the firing room to uh, the, uh, the activities at the launch pad and, and the mobile launcher and the pad itself. We reviewed all of those items. We do have some images here for you. Uh, first and foremost, the kinder, kindler and gentler loading operation uh, that we learned out of the, uh, out of the prior um, launch attempts. 
performed as expected. Uh, the the uh, team operation was was uh, great as well, um, and uh, and and we we successfully executed the load there. Uh, the software for the launch control center and the handover of the command and control again uh, met all of our expectations. The ignition overpressure and sound suppression system uh, to uh, dampen the acoustic shock and and keep the uh, deck of the mobile launcher. Um, uh, protected from the uh, from the flames of the uh, of the space launch system as it as it lifted off, performed as expected. Uh, the mobile launcher umbilical releases were all within uh, specification and performed as expected. And the mobile launcher structure itself um, held up well, and and the structural inspections have all passed there. Uh, if we could roll the video of the drone footage of the mobile launcher, um, this will, is essentially a top down look of the entire mobile launcher, and uh, this is the side that faces the, um, the rocket as it lifted off. You can see all the umbilicals in the retracted position, and we will go all the way down to the deck of the mobile launcher here. And, um, you know, we do have a, a little bit of discoloration simply from the heat of the rocket, but um, all of the interfaces uh, are, are in good shape. The uh, mobile launcher itself is uh, it has a little bit of damage to it, but it will be ready to fly um, the uh, crude launch on Artemis II. And here we are looking down into the flame trench. Uh, the damage that we did see uh, pertained to uh, really just a couple of areas um, on the zero deck. If if we could pull up the um, the image of the uh, elevator doors, we we did. Um, all right. So here we're seeing the image of the uh, mobile launcher deck. Uh, we have exhaust that comes out of the solid boosters that is right at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, we had a large amount of water come out of the water birds and the, the uh, water sound suppression system to, to keep the, the deck protected. You can see here that the uh, water sound suppression uh, did a great job with the exception of right around the edges of the flame trench. Uh, if we could go to the next photo, uh, and here you're simply seeing some of the paint, paint discolored and paint removed. This is the entire deck uh, of the mobile launcher, and you see the two tail service mast umbilicals um, that are that are in the foreground on the right. Um, our, our launch director Charlie Blackwell Thompson says she walked into the into the uh, tail service mast umbilicals, and they were pristine inside. Uh, so all of the enclosures and and all of the uh, close up activities um, to. Uh, to basically button this thing up as the rocket was lifting off, um, protected all the all the hardware there. Uh, if we, there's our elevator doors. Um, the uh, elevator system is uh, not functioning right now. Uh, we uh, we had the world's most powerful rocket, and and in the pressure, uh, basically blow the doors off of our elevators. Um, this is why it took a little longer uh, to inspect. The, um, the mobile launcher uh, is a very tall structure, and right now the elevators are inoperable, and we need to get those back in the service. Uh, and then if we look at, at the next photo, um, I, I love this photo. Uh, when I saw it, I was like, wow. Um, this is one of the cameras on the zero deck and the mobile launcher uh, being looked at um, from the 274-foot level on one of the towers. So um, you can see, again, the heat of the uh, boosters um, scorching the camera. The camera uh, housing survived, but uh, it just goes to show the environment there on the on the on the zero deck um, is is not the friendliest when when you have the world's most powerful rocket lifting off. Um, again, that said, we did um, a thorough inspection of the mobile launcher, and it is it has passed. There, the only items that are noteworthy of damage are the ones that that uh, I've I've shown you there. We did have two cameras out. We also did have um, some damage to uh, pneumatic lines associated with uh, gaseous nitrogen and gaseous, gaseous helium, and um, that in turn caused the uh, oxygen sensors on the pad to show that there were low oxygen readings until we got the uh, until we got the uh, leaks in the pneumatic lines isolated, which is why it took a little longer to gain access out of the pad. Um, in terms of, uh, did we find any flight items? You don't want to find flight items at the, at the pad, right? Uh, in terms of did we find flight items, we found two. Uh, the first was uh, the booster throat, pl throat plug material, which uh, is purposefully um, uh, expelled from the throat of each booster uh, at liftoff when, when the boosters ignite. 
uh, and we did find that in the pad perimeter. Um, we did need a little bit of time to map that out. That is a very normal thing, finding the blue booster throat plug material. And then we did find one piece of the, um, the uh, 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 RTV material from the Orion spacecraft. It is unclear whether that was actually liberated during launch or whether that was uh, released during the during the hurricane, uh, but it was found on the infield. So, overall, uh, again, a very clean uh, system. The uh, the exploration ground systems uh, exceeded our performance. We did have a little bit of damage, and the and the mobile launcher will be ready to support um, uh, Artemis II, and we had accounted for that uh, previously in our in our replan and our budget. Um, for uh, uh, the time between Artemis 1 and 2. Uh, let's see, and then um, if we could pull up some additional images of the optical navigation sensor. Uh, we have been uh, testing and cert certifying the uh, optical navigation sensor, and here is a view of Earth from our optical navigation sensor on board Orion. And then the next image, uh, I believe, is of the moon uh, from the optical navigation sensor, and this, this is um, essentially a, a an alternative means of um, of uh, gaining our or updating our navigation on board the spacecraft. Um, the last image that I'll show and share with you is the uh, much sought after uh, Snoopy image, and we did get a uh, an image uh, released today. Um, the administrator released the uh, image of, of Snoopy. Uh, he is in the uh, lower center. Uh, floating uh, in, near the empty seat, and, and we've highlighted him here. Uh, so that is our zero-G indicator Snoopy. Again, we're proud to have him on board as, as a symbol of flight safety. I personally am wearing my silver Snoopy that I, that I received here because this is, this is not just about flying fly, fly hardware. This is about um, uh, you know, being as safe uh, as we can uh, given the uh, hostile environment that we're flying into uh, for astronauts, and, and we take this very seriously. Uh, flight safety for our astronauts is, is paramount. So with that, um, we've gone through a lot of materials in the last couple of days, and uh, happy to talk more about those uh, uh, at, at, in whatever questions you might have. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Leah. Thanks, Mike. And I will pass it over to our Artemis One ASA and Entry Flight Director, Judd Freeling. All right. Thanks, Leah. Uh, let's see. So uh, we continue to test out the vehicle and uh, put it through its paces to make sure uh, we understand exactly how to operate it. Uh, previous to this morning, we uh, have exercised all three means that we have of uh, uh, providing a translational capability for our orbit adjusts. Um, uh, maneuvers, uh, so uh, in uh, orbit uh, outbound trajectory corrections uh, one, two, and three, uh, we successfully exercise the uh, OHMS engine and then the uh, RCS or the reaction control system uh, engines uh, to provide translational thrust. And then uh, our third burn, we, uh, we exercise the plus X or auxiliary engines, and they all work perfectly. Uh, uh, great, great story there. Uh, Leading up uh, then uh, to this morning, uh, we had uh, outbound powered flight, as was mentioned. Uh, that that was the uh, largest burn, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, to date at about uh, 586 foot per second. It was about a two and a half uh, minute burn uh, on the backside of the moon uh, that, that uh, successfully started our entry into the uh, distant retrograde orbit, so it's a part of a two-burn sequence. The second sequence is going to be the DRO or direct uh, uh, DRO insertion burn uh, that is going to be uh, on Friday. Uh, let's see. Uh, you roll a video. Uh, we had some great video leading up to uh, our uh, outbound uh, powered flight, and uh, we were able to, to, to live stream that. Uh, this is this is absolutely amazing to me. Uh, you can you can see the Earth kind of setting uh, towards the the moon that's in in sunlight there. Um, it just just I, I came in this morning and it was just just stunned at at at, uh, at watching this video. Right. Uh, I think we have the other video of uh, Earth rise as well. Do we have that one on the back side? Nope, we don't. Uh, on the back side, we had uh, a good uh, Earth rise as well. The, the moon, however, was not uh, in, in, uh, in sun, so we just saw kind of the Earth popping out from what looked like a black, uh, black mass, and so, uh, so that, was a, that was a really good, uh, interesting um, way to view the, the Earth rise. Uh, let's see, I think we have another picture here of the trajectory that we took. 
uh, as we went uh, across the moon's uh, surface. So the first one kind of gives a, uh, an overview picture uh, of the, tra the, uh, the trajectory. Here we go. Uh, and you, as you can see, the sun's kind of uh, behind uh, the uh, the moon in this case, and so it, it makes the front side of the moon that's that's facing Earth uh, in darkness. Uh, this is a, a representation of how uh, where we did the uh, the outbound power flight maneuver. That was uh, we're approximately uh, 328 statute miles above the Earth when we performed that burn. Uh, as you can see, these are the sites of uh, all of the Apollo uh, missions and where they actually landed. So uh, I'll show you uh, the next slide, please. Shows you uh, as we get a little bit closer, uh, you can see uh, that's the point of closest approach that we had after OPF, uh, where, as Leah mentioned, uh, we were 81 uh, statute miles above uh, the surface of the moon. Uh, next slide. I think we have a ground track that actually shows we don't have that. Okay. Uh, so shortly after that, uh, that, that point, uh, we actually uh, uh, went directly over the Apollo 11 uh, landing site, and uh, we were about 1,300 statute miles above that. Uh, obviously, we were in, in darkness at the time, so we, we weren't, weren't able to get pictures of that. But um, what I will tell you is that uh, on our return power uh, flyby, uh, burn. The moon is expected, uh, the, the, the earth facing part of the moon is expected to be in sun, and so we're working a plan to see if we can get pictures of those uh, Apollo landing sites as we're, as we're flying by. Uh, one thing I'll note is uh, we didn't expect to, to get live stream uh, video like, uh, like we got today, and the reason was uh, our pre-flight predictions uh, said we would not have enough bandwidth to, to downlink all of the, uh, the files that we plan to do for uh, critical uh, telemetry as well as do live stream. As part of the testing of the system, that means we're also testing out the deep space network, and uh, and so we're we're kind of uh, probing and and seeing how far we can press those bandwidth limitations. And it turns out, uh, prior to that, we were able to uh, to to be able to live stream. So uh, from this point forward, uh, that's going to be one of our our priorities. Where when when we have the bandwidth available, uh, we'll go ahead and live stream uh, video from Orion whenever we're not doing uh, uh, CIT payloads or Listo payload events or other uh, other uh, actions where where we we need the higher bandwidth and so I think Leah we've got a we've got a a use uStream uh, website uh, that uh, that that will be putting that and so it'll be available on the web uh, all the time so so that'll be a good news story. Uh, additionally, I would say in the in the in the interest of um, of testing the system and and uh, and giving you an idea of how long it takes to get data down uh, I think all of us are used to the, the ISS and uh, and and how quickly we get data down there I can I can tell you on ISS when we we downlink data we get about a gigabit of data it takes us less than a minute to get down uh, but in the deep, deep space network uh, the data rates that we're experiencing on Orion to get that same gigabit of data uh, uh, originally took us 90 minutes so uh, you know, a, a lot, a lot longer. Uh, the uh, the tests that we've been doing and trying to, to to help that bandwidth problem, we we've we've gotten that down now to about 45 minutes to get that one gigabit, uh, gigabyte of data. But it's still a relatively long amount of time, and we've got lots and lots and lots of data uh, to get down. And obviously, that that uh, high resolution data and, and video uh, takes a long time to downlink. So, but we're doing our best we can, and and, and we'll we'll continue to to download those as as. Uh, as we can. Uh, I'll also mention uh, in, in the interest, uh, you know, Mike showed the pictures of the OpNav uh, pictures of both the Earth and the Moon. Uh, that has now been certified, so it's it's actually a NAV source now we can use if we were to lose uh, communications uh, with the Orion spacecraft, it would automatically use that as a NAV source uh, to uh, to navigate back home. Uh, with all of the uh, the pre-planned uh, commands that we've put on board. So that's a, a good news story. I'll tell you, uh, also in the veins of the performance of the vehicle, uh, it, the, the, from the propellant budget, uh, we're doing really well. We've, we've used over uh, 3,700 pounds of prop to date, uh, which is about 76 pounds less than we expected. Uh, from pre-flight pre uh, predictions, uh, and it's also uh, about 2,100 pounds above what we require uh, for the end of mission, and that's, that translates into about 560-some-odd foot per second 
available to us above what we need uh, for the mission. So that's a really good news story. Um, the last thing I'll tell you is uh, DRI, the, the uh, DRO insertion burn, uh, is going to happen on Friday. Uh, that's going to be another big burn, not quite as big as uh, the uh, the uh, OPF maneuver, the outbound powered flight by, flyby maneuver. Uh, that's going to be come in around 362 foot per second. So uh, that's all I have for now. So, Lee, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Judd. And I will turn it over to Howard Hugh, Orion Program Manager. All right. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I think uh, Mike and uh, Judd have uh, stolen some of my thunder, but uh, the vehicle continues to operate exceptionally. Um, we have seen uh, really good performance across the board on all our subsystems and systems, and uh, certainly really happy with the performance, and, and today was a terrific day. Uh, um, you know, uh, we started early in the morning and uh, getting ready for the OPF, and we saw tremendous performance coming out of that. You know, I'll just put a finer point uh, on what Judd said earlier. You know, we were expecting a 585 or 589 uh, foot per second on that OPF burn, and, and we, we did it in 585.9. So really great uh, performance um, of the prop system and, and continued so. And, and Judd said something else. You know, we've exercised all three of our propulsive elements, the main engine, our auxiliary engines, and RCS across the various correction burns and the OPF, and uh, they've all performed very well, and the overall prop system has maintained the pressure and uh, executed and regulated uh, the propulsive elements uh, really excellently. So we're very happy with that. Um, overall, like I said, our performance continues to be uh, going very well. Uh, another uh, point I think we discussed, uh, my colleague discussed uh, at the last briefing, you know, we're generating a lot of power. We're generating over 22.32% uh, more power than uh, we had planned out of the solar rays. Very, uh, very good. And of course, we're also using less power, 34.31%. So overall, uh, in the power system, uh, great performance there, um, along with the prop system. And uh, I would say that, uh, you know, um, Judd also said about our op nav, that's a that's a really a backup case where we uh, lose permanent or we have loss of uh, calm with the ground. Uh, our overall navigation system is performing as expected and uh, uh, really well, and we're getting obviously good ground uh, inputs on our state uh, updates for the nav system and we expect that to continue as, as well. Um, let's see, finally, I would say that, uh, you know, all the images you saw and all the videos, uh, and Judd talked a little bit about uh, increase and learning about how much to push on in terms of performance on DSN. You know, it took, uh, I would thank the flight team, flight control team, and our engineering team. They did a great job uh, last night of trying to figure out how we can best position ourselves to get all these uh, great images and uh, great videos that we've seen uh, throughout the day and what you've seen today and, and really thank the team because I, I think I think the team has done tremendous work of giving us the, the highlights of what uh, the mission uh, images and all the all the video that we've seen and really happy to see uh, what what we see from the moon and of course looking back on the earth. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Leah. Thanks, Howard. And a live view now inside the white flight control room uh, here in Mission Control Houston of those teams working around the clock all the way through splashdown. So we're going to open it up for question and answer at this time. If you are on the phone and would like to ask a question, please press star one to raise your hand and star two to withdraw your question if it has already been asked. I also ask that you please state your name and affiliation as well as to whom your question is directed and please limit to one question at a time. That way we can address everyone and uh, potentially get to some follow-ups afterward. So we can start here in the room. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Caro with uh, Aviation Week and Space Technology. Uh, my question is for Judd. We, we've heard a lot about the uh, the flight hardware and the launch control team. I'm just w wondering about the flight control team. Do you think they're learning a lot, or how would you describe what they're learning and how that plays forward with Artemis? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Great question. Uh, so. You're absolutely right. Not not only is this this flight about learning about the hardware, but it's also learning about how the humans interact with the hardware. And 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 I would say we are absolutely are learning a lot about uh, you know just the few examples that I gave you about how do you you know how 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 much off predicts are you going to be what what kind of ways can you optimize performance of the vehicle you know. 
how how do we uh, do uh, the burns in an efficient manner? You know, what are, what do we do to prep the navigation system for them? So it's it's all kinds of things that that we we learn that you just can't um, simulate because there, our simulators are only as good as what we thought and predicted pre-flight. And so so now we're getting a, a really good opportunity to kind of anchor not only the engineering models that, that Howard has, but also the operational models uh, that we're, we're using in the control center. Okay, another here in the room. Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Howard. Last week after launch, you said you dreamed of this since you were a little kid. Is it living up to your expectations? Um, above and beyond, I would say. Uh, I was telling somebody today uh, that, uh, you know, we're coming every day and, and uh, it, it doesn't seem like work. I mean, it is just fabulous. I want to hear the information that's coming from the spacecraft, uh, learning about the spacecraft and, and being excited about what we're doing. And, and it's, just, it's just been phenomenal. I, I, I've got a big smile every day. I just see people and I'm smiling uh, and it's just been terrific. Thank you. Eric Berger with uh, Ars Technica. I think uh, a lot of us share that excitement too, Howard. A uh, question for you and then one, one for Mike. First of all, you said you did an exterior survey. I know MMOD was a concern on this flight. Were you able to get any data on that? It sounds like it, it looked pretty clean. And then for Mike on the EGS question, um, you, you know, you've got some plenty of time to work on this for, for Artemis too, but in the future you'd like to increase cadence. So are there steps you can take to sort of mitigate the damage that occurred to the mobile launch tower? Um, from this flight to sort of that, that you'll be able to address that. Uh, just any words on that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, let me start. Uh, so Mike mentioned we did, uh, our engineering team did a, a full uh, look at uh, the entire spacecraft with the images we got from our solar array cameras and cleared it. Uh, no MMOD damage that they could see. Um, and so I think it was an exhaustive analysis that the team went through already. And they actually cleared us for reentry. Uh, so it was a really good um, set of work by the team. Of course, they'll continue to look and, and investigate if they see anything else from the images, but uh, so far looks, it looks really good from our surveys. Yeah, and Eric, thank you for the question. Um, in terms of uh, the operations at America Spaceport and the CAPE um, associated with getting uh, Ryan and SLS ready to fly, we've learned every step of the way, uh, whether it was back in what we called offline processing, uh, which was where we um, loaded the uh, the rocket, or, I'm sorry, the, uh, the upper stage and the uh, spacecraft with uh, hypergalls and high pressure gases, or whether it was uh, stacking the vehicle in the vehicle assembly building, or whether it was the roll operations or the pad operations. Uh, the team has gotten more and more efficient as we've gone through that. Uh, certainly the level of automation has improved, and, and we still have a few things that we will improve in terms of automation. Uh, we will uh, also have, um, you know, in, ter in terms of vehicle turnaround uh, or the, uh, the pad turnaround, uh, we will apply whatever lessons learned uh, we took from, from this launch. We are still going through some of the findings and uh, seeing what those mean. The, um, the uh, umbilicals and the hydrogen leaks are certainly a key focus area, uh, and, uh, and some of the software automation in the launch control center are key focus areas. All right, we will turn to the phone bridge for some questions. First up is Bill Harwood with CBS News. Hey, Gus, thanks very much. Um, one quick question for Mike Serafin. Um, based on your data review, if you had astronauts on board for this flight, would anything have changed so far? In other words, are the, are the funnies and things like that you've seen, would they have been sufficient not to press ahead today, or, or would they be just fine as is? Bill, thank you for the question. Uh, as we talked prior to Artemis 1 um, on this uncrewed test flight, we had a lean forward strategy in terms of uh, whether we would proceed or, or accept risk at a decision gate. So uh, that is uh, a, a tough question relative to measuring against the, the criteria we've established here on this flight. But that said, in terms of overall system failures, we haven't seen a single thing on the rocket or on the spacecraft that would have caused us um, to question our, our reliability or our redundancy, uh, which is why this has largely been a nominal mission. We've proceeded through all these decision gates. Um, we've got some just overall uh, operational and systems lessons learned, as, as uh, Howard had talked and his Judd has alluded to. There have been a number of things where our uh, 
plans and our predicts didn't quite match what we thought from an engineering and from a modeling standpoint, we will in turn roll that into uh, crewed flight. But you know, overall, it's it's been largely a green light flight in terms of the um, uh, decision gates, and, and that is a very positive thing. Um, I would just keep 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 in mind that that's in the context of this of this uncrewed uh, test flight, uh, where we do have this lean forward strategy. Up next on the phone, we have Andrea Leinfelder with the Houston Chronicle. Hi, um, thanks for taking the question. So my question is um, for Judd. You know, I want to know more about the mood and mission control. It's been 50 years since we've had a spacecraft built for humans this close to the moon. And um, now that we're getting these images back, what's the mood like and how are you reacting to these images, particularly since they are so similar to the Earthrise one from Apollo? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. I would say I would characterize it uh, somewhat, at least the folks that, that are in the viewing rooms uh, around uh, the, the, the flight controllers as giddy. Uh, I mean, the, the, the it, people are just amazed, right? You know, uh, as far as the flight, flight controllers themselves, um, they're, they're absolutely astounded as well, you know, that, that uh, these, these great, great uh, videos that they're, that they're enabling to, to get from, uh, from the Orion spacecraft, as well as that, um, you know, they're just happy that all of the hard work and dedication that they've spent for years, many, many, many years, uh, is, is, is really paying dividends uh, so now. So, so I, yeah, I'd, I'd say everybody's in a great mood. Can I jump in on that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'll say that from an engineering team and our program perspective, we had a lot of people in a conference room and, and we we're like kids. Uh, as soon as the uh, pictures came up, people were taking pictures of what was on the screen and just smiles across the board. I mean, this is a, like I said, just not for me, only a dream for many people who work at NASA and who work with us on our contractor teams and across in both engineering and flight operations. And, and it's a tremendous day. And so you'll see, you said giddy, I'd say, you know, just big smiles and just like a kid at a candy store, I would say, just how happy we are. Next on the phone, we have Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Thanks very much uh, for the briefing, and um, thank you, uh, Mike, for your efforts to sharpen comms. It's appreciated. Um, I have three quick questions. Uh, one is, um, do you have the name, and um, this may be for Judd, do you have the name, the nearest named site on the moon's backside that was closest to Orion's point of um, uh, the closest it came during the flyby? And the speed of Orion when it passed over um, the Apollo 11 site? Uh, let's see. I, I do not have the, the name of the closest site uh, when we were at closest approach. We certainly can get you that. So, Leah, I think we can we can get Orion, uh, Irene, uh, Irene that afterwards. And as far as I didn't understand your question about the Apollo 11 site. Um, how fast was Orion moving when it went over the Apollo 11 site? Yeah. And then my other one is um, how much time was there a comms? Um, um, how much time was Orion out of comms in, in all? Yep. So uh, we were out of comm for about 34 minutes, and uh, we were going about 5,000. Uh, let's see, when we were over uh, OPF, uh, we were going about 5,023 miles per hour, um, and then of course we picked up speed after that. Thanks. All right. Up next on the phone, we have Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Yes. Hi. Probably for Mike, um, if I may. After liftoff, Administrator Nelson um, gave an A-plus grade for liftoff anyway. Um, what grade would you give the mission to date? And I know there is still uh, priorities ahead, uh, namely splashdown. But since it's going so smoothly so far in flight, um, is, is there any breath of relief from you yet? Are you reveling in any of this yourself? I mean, what are your emotions? Thanks. Marcia, thank you for the question. Um, we are on flight day six of a 26-day mission, so I would give it a cautiously optimistic A+. Uh, we, we've got, uh, again, we're, we're largely complete with the first leg. Uh, we're entering the second leg, and then we got the return leg. And our, our capstone objective, our, the second half of our priority one objective, uh, demonstrate the uh, spacecraft at lunar reentry conditions um, is realized on 
landing and splashdown day and reentry day, as well as priority three, which is uh, splashdown and recovery of the vehicle. So, uh, for me, I said it on on launch day. There's relief that we're underway, but there's a heightened sense of awareness that uh, that we've got um, this mission underway, and and we've got um, the Artemis uh, spacecraft in play. And this is uh, again a, a risk buy down for crewed flights. So we're taking it very seriously. Um, I uh, I will rest well on uh, December. 11th after splashdown and recovery is complete, um, as will these gentlemen um, and, and their teams. Uh, you know, I, I know how focused this team is. Um, myself, I I tend to just stay focused and and can continue to do that um, as as long as necessary here. So um, that's that's where I'm at. Next up, we have David Curley with the Discovery Channel. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike Surf and a couple of questions. Uh, one, you, you you talked about a couple of issues that concern you. What is the most concerning? Uh, and by the way, I'd like to second Irene's uh, point that uh, thank you for trying to give us more. And secondly, uh, the flyover of Tranquility Base, I know you're um, – I don't understand all the ways we're going to see images. When will we see those images? Thank you. Um, let's see. David, could you clarify your question about concerns or issues? I, I'm not. Um... You, mentioned, you mentioned that there were a couple things that have popped up that have you concerned. I mean, I think we're all hearing that you guys feel really great about the way the mission is going, but you've had a couple of funnies that concern you even in uh, in space, is there an issue that is particularly concerning to you? Okay. Uh, thank you for that clarification, David, in the question. Um, in terms of uh, concerns, you know, they are low level in terms of we don't fully understand what, uh, what the system and the flight hardware is telling us, but we've got ample redundancy and we are recovering from from these funnies that we see uh, the two where we have anomaly resolution teams active uh, the first one pertains to something called a latching current limiter or an LCL on the power um, uh, control and distribution unit on the Orion spacecraft um, we've got eight of these and for some reason they're apparently they're um, being uncommanded uh, open, and we don't understand why. Uh, they are a um, inline power feed from the solar arrays to the spacecraft. Um, because of the level of redundancy, there's, there's, uh, if I recall, Howard, there's three feeds into uh, each of these um, um, two two feeds into the PDCUs. But the way that they're matrixed from the um, from the the four solar array wings. Um, there's there's plenty of redundancy there. We just don't understand why these things are are being uncommanded open. But that said, the team is recovering from them. So so that they are um, working their way through an anomaly resolution team and an anomaly resolution process, um, just to understand again what the hardware is telling us. Uh, the other one uh, pertains to the uh, to the star trackers. They have uh, random access memory, and they are getting um, uh, bits set in them that we have to recover with a power cycle. And, to, and the most likely cause of that is, is simply a single event upset associated with a radiation hit. Um, we've had a number of those. The team has had the power cycle, the star trackers, and, and uh, they've recovered every time. Um, again, it, we're trying to understand what the hardware is telling us in the, um, in the uh, anomaly resolution team process for both of those issues. Um, I, I again don't think that uh, this is a high level concern and, and I'll, I guess I'll ask Howard for any additional thoughts on those. Yeah, let, let me uh, maybe uh, provide a little bit more detail on the star tracker. It's not so much a, you know, these are radiation tolerant and hardened boxes. So when a um, random access memory bit gets set, it automatically corrects it. So it's working, it's operating just fine. What, what, uh, what's happening is it tells us, it sets a bit that says, hey, I did have to do this error detection and correction, which is very standard in a lot of processors uh, that require to go to deep space. So it triggers that, hey, some event happened, they fixed it, 
box is performing nominally, outputting a very good navigation data. Uh, it just tells us that. And when we re reset it, it's just more for resetting that uh, trigger that says, hey, I had an event which I had to do an error correction. So it's not so much the box has an issue and we have to reset the box to get performance out of it. It's more along the lines of indicated there was a problem. The box did its job. It, re it changed or it, it did the correction uh, on its own as, as planned and then it moved forward and, and, and that's what we're we're doing, and, and we've learned a lot from actually our other organizations or other programs. We've talked a lot about them. A lot of people have seen similar uh, events uh, with their star trackers, and uh, that expertise and that knowledge we've been sh getting shared with other programs, we're collecting that information and uh, reflecting that with our data that we've got. So certainly uh, uh, great data in terms of operating environment that is in deep space and in that radiation environment and uh, good to know that other programs have seen something similar. We'll try to match that up with our experience base and our data and uh, we'll have a, a good good information for the MMT uh, coming up. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Howard. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'm confident that the team is going to work through this and, yep. and understand what the, what the hardware is telling us. And then in terms of the flyover, the Apollo 11, Judd, do you want to take that yeah, one? I'll take that. Uh, so, since this first OPF uh, maneuver was planned for the Earth-facing side of the moon uh, to be in darkness, we didn't have any plans really to try to image. Uh, but we will plan uh, to try and image those sites uh, when we do the return power flyby, uh, which will be on the 5th of uh, December. And so um, probably take us a, a day or two to get that, uh, that imagery back. All right, up next on the phone, we have Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Thanks. Um, a question for Mike or Judd. Um, can you just review what do you get? What does the mission benefit from a lunar distant retrograde orbit versus doing something like they did on Apollo 8 and entering a more circular orbit around the moon? And then just to, to fact check, I've heard 80 miles and 81 miles for the closest approach. Is that just a rounding um, or what was the exact uh the exact mileage for the closest approach today. Do you want to take the mileage, and I'll I'll handle the DRO. Jim. Yeah. So uh, the 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 <laughs> the closest approach we had to the moon was seventy point five one nautical miles, which translates into eighty one statute miles. Okay. And Robert, thank you for the question about the benefit of the distant retrograde orbit. Um, if you look at the systems that we are uh, testing with the Orion spacecraft, the distant retrograde orbit serves as a purposeful stress test of the overall system in terms of um, the large propulsive maneuvers uh, to enter a, uh, a lunar orbit and exit a lunar orbit. We know we need two maneuvers, so we're, we're performing two large maneuvers. In terms of stressing the navigation and communication system, we are going to fly uh, at its farthest point about 268,000 miles from Earth on this mission. So if you go back to that, uh, that mission map that I showed you, point 11 on that racetrack is 268,000 miles from Earth. That is the farthest point a human-capable spacecraft will have ever gone. Um, when, when we uh, get there. And that also stress our uh, communications and navigation and tracking systems um, from a deep space network and radiometric tracking, as well as a, a signal strength and, and communications um, uh, system on board the Orion spacecraft. So if you're looking at the corners of the boxes um, in terms of you know uh, the power and communications and thermal and nav and all the systems, uh, the distant retrograde orbit is a is a um, a great mission to uh, stress the system and buy down that risk, and uh, that's why we're flying the distant retrograde orbit. Next question is from Kristen Fisher with CNN. Hi everyone. Sorry to uh, harp on the images, but since uh, I probably deal with uh, live TV and live images more than most on this call, I've got a few questions on that. One. I just want to be crystal clear. Are, are, are we done seeing high res images and video of the close by, the close uh, path of the moon, like the 80 miles off the surface? We're not going to see anything more of that tonight or in the next few days until December 5th when it comes back. That's question number one. And then question number two, you know, I understand that it takes 
this is not the ISS. It takes more time to get these high res images down. But is, is, are you guys seeing live videos in the control room? Um, before we do? And if so, why can't y'all share that data in real time? And we appreciate, you know, being able to see it as it approached the moon, but, um, you know, now and at other times, I guess, wh why not share, even if it is low res and not the greatest quality, why not just put that all out there for everyone to see um, so that, you know, fans of Artemis can, can follow along live and in real time? Thank you. All right, thanks for the question, Kristen. Uh, so as far as uh, the this morning, the images, uh, again, so at the closest approach, uh, the moon uh, facing the Earth part was in darkness, so we don't expect to, to get uh, very good, clear images of, of the, uh, the, the moon uh, while it was uh, coming into view. Uh, but we will downlink those, those particular high-res videos that we took continuously, uh, both uh, when we were on the backside of the moon and as we were coming through. So, so we, it will take us a few days to get those particular images done. Uh, the question earlier was about, uh, you know, can we get specific uh, images of the Apollo 11 site? And again, uh, during return power flyby, we expect the Earth-facing part of the sun, of, of the moon to be in sunlight, and so we will get pictures that will be much better. And will it'll be a, a couple of days after RPF that we will we will downlink those videos. As I mentioned, Kristen, uh, the uh, we did not expect to be able to see uh, live stream video at the same time we're doing all of our. Uh, file downlinks, and so this was something new that we just learned uh, a day or two ago that we would be able to do. And so, as soon as we um, we were able to to downlink live stream video of of some somewhat low res res, res quality, still uh, as you see from the from the video that we, we we put out on NASA TV, it was still pretty spectacular. Uh, but now that is going to be the new normal. Uh, we will we will live stream uh, camera data because we have now uh, figured out that we have the ability to do that and downlink all of our our uh, data in, in high res uh, resolution data at the same time. So we will put that, uh, and I think uh, mm -hmm. they put the uh, yeah, a, a website out here where we, you can uh, go ahead and uh, and and view that live stream data. Um, all the time. So as soon as we have data um, that, that that we're streaming, we'll we'll send it out to the web so you guys can see it. And I'll just pile onto that one, Kristen. Uh, we will absolutely share more imagery from what we uh, what we saw today during the uh, outbound power flyby and the close approach to the moon. Um, as I was leaving the Mission Control Center to head over here today, I'm walking down the hall and I had somebody grab me and say, "Hey, Mike, you need to see this." And they showed, they walked me up to a computer, and it was our um, imagery integration team, and they showed me four images um, of the uh, of the Orion spacecraft with the solar ray wingtip, its uh, service module in the foreground, and then very high resolution images of the moon where it's getting larger and larger and larger, and it, you could see the curvature of the trajectory, and uh, as as the uh, spacecraft approached the moon. And you could see individual surface features on the moon, um, you know, craters and just little little contours. Um, that was as I was headed over here, and uh, and that is yet to come. So we've got a lot more. Uh, we just need to get it off the spacecraft, and then we need to get it through the uh, the compliance processes, and then the distribution process here on the ground. So there's really kind of two buffers. One is it's recorded on board. Uh, if, if it is not uh, broadcast in real time, and then once it gets to the ground, it is it is archived, number one, and then it's distributed, and then we go through um, a screening process here, and then it hits the street um, for folks to view. So um, just be patient with us as we go through those processes. Uh, there is much more to come. Uh, it may have been yesterday's news, uh, but but um, this, the, when we get it to the ground, we get it distributed, it'll be the first time everybody sees those images. And, and I can't wait to see um, more of what, what we've captured. I'm excited to say it is today's news. Uh, those are live. <laughs> those are live online. Those images that you were just discussing with uh, Orion and the Moon as it approached the outbound power flyby burn. You can find those on our Johnson Space Center Flickr account as well as on images.nasa.gov. Uh, but on Flickr, there is an entire album dedicated to Artemis One. We are uploading those as quickly as we get them. Uh, we love to see them too. And additionally, with that live link uh, that's going to be available, there will be some intermittent periods where we don't have uh, view 
views from the spacecraft, but it is a great opportunity to take a look and see what Orion is uh, is seeing for itself. Um, additionally, we're working on a different link that'll be a little bit easier to find too. So just wanted to give it to you as soon as we had it. Our next question is from Daniel Regeria from Our Drony. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, congratulations, first of all. It was uh, amazing to see today your live streaming. Uh, the question is, if there were people on board, if there were astronauts on board, so I am, everything went okay on this flight, I'd like to fly around the moon. I'm talking about G-forces, environmental things like temperature, pressure, all things. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, I did not follow the question. Um, could, could you try to repeat the question? Oh, yes. Imagine you can put right now astronauts on board of what I am. Uh, was everything okay to fly on this first flight or Orion, uh, like uh, temper temperature, pressure, uh, environmental things like G-forces on the, 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 the launch, and the, the, all, all of this trip? Yeah, thank you for the question, Daniel. So you're asking if people were flying on board, what were the uh, cabin uh, conditions be like in terms of temperature, pressure, and G-forces? Uh, we certainly, from the from the launch phase uh, all the way through the separation events, it, it was uh, you know what we anticipated uh, in terms of G forces uh, and uh, and going through the uh, launch phase um, towards the tail end of the launch profile. The the rocket did go into a G three um, G throttling profile, so that was the maximum amount of force that we saw on the um, on the acceleration. Um, and then in flight, you know we we have a. Uh, you know, a a shirt sleeve cabin environment. It's it's uh, you know in the 70ish degree range, uh, maybe maybe a little bit warmer than that. And then when we come home, the uh, the capsule is expected through the uh, direct skip reentry um, to see a uh, peak set of g forces in the four four and a half uh, times the force of gravity range. So, uh, in terms of uh, humans' ability to fly on the vehicle, based on the, the data that we've seen thus far. Uh, all signs point to, yes, we're on a good path to do that. And uh, Judd, uh, if you have anything to add to that one. Nope. Uh, I, I would say also, uh, since this is a, an uncrewed mission, uh, we don't have the environmental control system that we would have on Artemis II. And of, of course, Artemis II is going to be, a, that's going to be one of the huge objectives is to just test out that uh, environmental control system, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, to condition all of the atmosphere uh, in, in, in Orion. So. Um, but but you know all that all that being said uh, you know the the uh, the pressure is going to be you know one atmosphere ish around uh, you know fourteen seven psi I think uh, and um, and and uh, similar to what you would have as, as Mike said is a shirt sleeve environment. Yeah. Howard, anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll just uh, you know uh, the picture popped up a little uh, just a second ago or so. You know we've got Munich and Campos. We've got accelerometers. On the Munikin, I mean that's one of the things uh, we're measuring as well as we uh, ex uh, experience all the flight phases, and certainly very important as uh, we land uh, with the crew capsule, and uh, make sure we're measuring and understand the environment that the crew would be in. Besides, uh, obviously, the uh, shirt sleeve environment and the uh, temperatures that we would experience. Yes, yeah, so, so that's a great point, Howard. Um, um, so we. The, the response that I gave you, Daniel, was based on the uh, telemeter data that's coming to the ground, um, based on what the, the rocket and the spacecraft are telling us. But we actually have witness sensors on board the spacecraft uh, from the perspective of where an astronaut would sit through Munikin Campos and um, some of the other uh, Munikins that we have on board. And we'll get that information post-flight. Thank you. Thank you all. And we have one uh, time for one last question. This is Micah Maidenberg with the Wall Street Journal. Hey, y'all. Uh, thanks for making time. Not sure who this would go to, but I was just curious about Callisto, uh, the tech demo on board. Any uh, initial indications about how it's performing or, or what you're learning from that demonstration? Thanks a lot. I think uh, we've had, a, a, I think, a couple of already uh, live uh, uh, technology, uh, I guess, assessments of the of the Callisto payload, and it's operating very well. 
uh, across the board. Um, we've getting good visuals and good communications, and thanks to Judd's team uh, allocating uh, some bandwidth uh, to allow that to happen. And uh, right now, um, based on those sessions, uh, things are looking very well with that payload. All right, that's time. That's all the time we have for questions uh, this afternoon. Thank you again to all of our briefers for joining us, all of you for asking questions. Uh, our next live coverage will be of the distant retrograde insertion maneuver. That's Friday, November 25th, and we will be going live on air at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. Again, we do now have live streaming from Orion. Uh, that's at go.nasa.gov slash 3UU. N7HR, and we are still working on a link for that. Uh, but you can also get daily updates at blogs.nasa.gov slash Artemis. Additionally, we do have that Flickr album we mentioned, as well as images.nasa.gov, where we are sharing all the latest and greatest things we are getting from Orion. That'll do it for us today, and thank you all.